Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's the last day of winter, folks, but winter sports keep on rolling. On tonight's episode, we doubled the experts, doubled the analysis, and hopefully we'll get some hot takes. So stick around for Bobcat Breakdown. Good evening and welcome to tonight's show. I'm your host, Katie O'Keefe. And our first couple of experts come from the Harwood. Shane Dennehy and Brian Schwartz, welcome guys. Without a doubt, March is an exciting time for this Quinnipiac women's basketball team. And these are some of their last couple games. How do you guys feel about that? That's sad it's over, but it's been a long season, right? Yeah, it is. You know, final run. You know, I'm a senior graduating soon, so going to soak in these last few games, however many they have, so it's going to be some fun. A good couple games it will be, so we have a third straight NCAA appearance with this team. Two years ago in 2017, they got a 12 seed and made it to the Sweet 16. Last year, they were a 9 seed and lost in the round of 32. And this year, it was announced last night, the Bobcats got an 11 seed. Shane, I'll toss it to you. Does this 11 seed make sense for this team? Uh... Katie, I'm going to have to say yes, but first, I wouldn't say it was much of an announcement. Think of accidental leakage by ESPN. <laughs> You're right. But I do have to agree. I think an 11 seed is appropriate for this team, Brian. You know, they played a really tough out-of-conference schedule again, as Trisha Fabry has always been trying to do. And, you know, I want to say it didn't go as planned. They didn't really get the wins they want. They lost to Bucknell. They lost to Princeton. So... Those teams also did make the tournament, so that does help their case to bump up. And Trisha Fabry said that they should be on the 11 line, and that's how it turned out. And I think that is appropriate given the fact that they've run the tables in the MAC yet again, and they've won 50-something plus straight conference games. So I think it's appropriate given their out-of-conference schedule as well as what they did in the conference as well. Yeah, after they won the MAC tournament, Trisha Fabry told us after the game she expected to be around that 11 seed. But you know what? When you look at it, and I think this is kind of the crazy part of it, is they went undefeated in conference play, and typically, wow, that's crazy, right? No one would ever think that that would happen. But in the MAC this season, the rest of the opponents weren't very good. They didn't have much competition there. So obviously, that doesn't factor into it a lot. So obviously, the out-of-conference factors in a little bit more, and they didn't play that well in the out-of-conference. They didn't get as many wins as they would have hoped, and that's why they're an 11 seed and not a 10 like they were last year. And obviously, it speaks to volumes as... That's why Trisha Fabry schedules this tough out-of-conference schedule, because she knows that MAC play doesn't push them and doesn't get them a lot of credits. I mean, they were running the tables in the MAC yet again, and they're not getting any AP votes. And it's, they're, they're going 18 and 0 in conference play yet again for the second year in a row, and they're not getting anything. They so. did finally get one. They did, finally. After, after they ran the tables again. It's about time. The conference is just too easy for them. And given everything we know about this team, is this year their easiest way to the Sweet 16? I mean, there's a lot to consider with the senior class and the team's record and rankings of other teams. Brian, could this be their easiest trip to the Sweet 16? No, I don't think it's their easiest trip. I think the easiest one, look, none of them are easy. I think that that's not a great way to put it, but I think the most winnable one was the first one with Marquette and Miami. I think those two teams, they matched up well against them. And, you know, this year it's going to be tough. The first game is you're playing one of the top mid-major schools in the entire country in South Dakota State. They were number two on the collegeinsider.com mid-major poll. And then let's say you win that, then you probably, I mean, you're not going to face Fordham. So you're going to have to play Syracuse, and Syracuse is a really good team. They're in the ACC. They made it pretty far in the ACC tournament. So this is a team that's going to be tough to beat and a lot tougher than Miami or Marquette. Yeah, Brian, I'm going to agree. I think that with Quinnipiac two years ago, Marquette and Miami, easiest road. I, Carolyn Krieger, the Marquette head coach at the time, you know, she was like, we're not going to overlook Quinnipiac. But, you know, honestly, after that press conference, I was like, I don't believe her at all. I don't know who she's trying to fool. But Quinnipiac, you know, when Quinnipiac can match up against these teams height-wise, I would take them against almost any team in the country. I think they have the skill, and I think they're clicking now. So it's going to be interesting. But last year, easily their hardest. I mean, yes, Miami's a good draw. You know, their highest seed ever in the nine seed, but then you get UConn. So I think this year is their second easiest. You know, they get a fellow mid-major, South Dakota State, no joke, as you said, you know, six seed as a mid-major, that's quite impressive. But probably going to get Syracuse, who did go lose in the ACC semifinals to reigning national champions, Notre Dame. So I think it's going to be 
their second toughest route. You know, it's funny, some of these teams haven't even heard of Quinnipiac, but anything's possible in these tournaments like you two mentioned, upsets being my favorite, but let's say women's basketball loses in the first round. Shane, do you call that a disappointment? Yeah, Katie, I'm going to have to say if Quinnipiac loses in the first round, it's got to be a disappointment. I mean, I, I know you said a lot of these people, they may not know how to pronounce Quinnipiac, but when they see Quinnipiac pop up, they're, they're nervous because they know, they've seen what this team has been able to do the past two seasons, so they don't want to play them. They, Quinnipiac has gained a lot of respect, and no, the Mac's not good, but there's got to be something to say when you're running the table in conference play two years in a row, winning 50-something-plus straight games, running the Mac tournament like they did this past year, winning by 40 in the semis and then by 30 in the... So I think it would be a disappointment for them to go out to a fellow mid-major that they can match up with, and the way that Quinnipiac's playing right now with the skill that they have and the experience that they've... So I think this would be a disappointment, yeah. I think that this program expects to win in the NCAA tournament now. We've seen it the last two years, getting three wins in the last two years. Look, they're not going to make the Sweet 16 every year, but you expect to get that first win. Yes, they're the higher seed facing South Dakota State, but this is a team that you need to beat if you're Quinnipiac. You want to keep getting recognized. You want to keep moving up the ranks, being a top to mid-major ranks, and ultimately trying to get into that top 25 you got to beat a team like South Dakota State, and you got to move on in the NCAA tournament. And obviously, this also comes down to recruiting as well. you got to think of this, you know, five seniors graduating. This is another time to showcase what yeah. your program is about and showcase to these high-level recruits that you are recruiting that we expect to compete in the NCAA tournament every single year, as you alluded to, and we're expecting to win a game every single season. And so it's, it's a big-time chance for them to be facing a mid-major. And, and the other part of that is this could possibly be the best team that they've had over the last few years with the five seniors starting. This, I mean, Jed Fay is playing at her best. Aaron McClure is at her best. Paula Straubman is at her best. Thornton and Martin, you know, they're all at their best right now in their senior seasons. Obviously, they want this. They don't want to go out with a loss in the first round of the NCAA tournament right now. They expect to move further, and anything less is definitely a disappointment. Honestly, I would be surprised if they lost this first round, too. And here, this favorite question for you guys of the night, because you won't lose any buddy, betting money on this. Shane, how long can this team dance for? Uh, Katie, I'm going to say they can go back to the Sweet 16 in this year. I really think they have a good shot. I mean, draw in South Dakota State, that's a perfect draw for them to you know, get a team that's another mid-major, a team that they can match up with. And multiple players last night at, at the reveal, if you want to call it that, it wasn't really a reveal. They already knew. But... <laughs> Knowing the players and Trisha Fabry said that they're very similar to Maris and Quinnipiac handled that very well, obviously. And then Aaron McClure said that South Dakota State's bigger and better version of Maris. So it is going to be a tough game. I think they can handle that. And you know what? Looking at Syracuse's roster, you know, they do have one 6'4 center, which could be a problem. But like I said earlier, I think Quinnipiac, if they can match up height-wise with any team in the country, I think I'd take them. I really would. So I think they can swing that win and go back to the Sweet 16 again. Syracuse and Quinnipiac, I'm gonna, let's assume that they both win their first round game. Syracuse and Quinnipiac had four common opponents this year. Bucknell, Princeton, Niagara, and UCF. Quinnipiac was one and three against those teams. Obviously, they beat Niagara twice. And they beat them pretty handily. But those other teams, Bucknell, Princeton, UCF, that, those, were pretty, those were in some of the prettiest games of the year. Ooh. And this is, those are three teams that Syracuse beat. I, Syracuse is clearly a better team. And, yes, I know we could go to the last few years. Yeah, Miami, Marquette, they were, they were better teams coming in. But, but Quinnipiac's not beating Syracuse. I, I, they, they, in they, their they, home floor. Syracuse, yeah, Syracuse, they did that to Miami. Why not? Syracuse was 10-3 and three at the Carrier Dome. That's nice. I'm taking Q. Yeah. I, I, they, they can swing it. They, ha, they have the experience. I know they can. They've proven they can, they can handle this going to these away courts. They've done it in Miami. They can do it against Syracuse. How would you compare Jen Faye to Adelie Martucci? Because Adelie Martucci was that closer a few years ago for Quinnipiac, the lockdown defender. And obviously, Jen Faye is probably going to take that role this year. Lockdown defender? Aaron McClure's a lockdown defender. Okay, so even Aaron McClure. Is that better or worse than what Adelie Martucci did a few years ago in the postseason? No, I think this team is better than three years ago. I think Aaron McClure... I, I think she's the best defender in, Mac, in the MAC. I think she should have gotten sure. MAC Player of the Year. So I, and she always checks the best player. Look what she does, Rebecca Hand. It doesn't matter. She takes them out of the ball game. I have no doubt that she can go against a Syracuse player, no matter who Trisha Fabry or the assistant coaches assign her. But I think that she can quiet the team. And Quinnipiac, all this year, they have five seniors starting. 
They know how to play. They know how to communicate. You literally asked Trisha Fabry about Adele Thornton and Paula Stroutman communicating on defense, and she complimented yeah. for you for picking that up. So that's why they're going to win, because they communicate on defense. They know how to guard as a team. And so can Syracuse. They, they have, yeah. But and I, probably a lot better. Yeah, but they, they're not going to – yes, I know. <laughs> they're going to overlook the – they're not it's a mid-major. It's this, a mid-major. At, at this point, these teams, even in the ACC, a team like Syracuse, they know who Quinnipiac is. They know what Quinnipiac can do, and they're going to come out, and they're going to beat Quinnipiac if they get that far. It's going to be close. It's going to be a close game. Quinnipiac's going to edge them, though. Hmm. Exciting stuff ahead, and that's their first game this Saturday. 11th-seeded Quinnipiac will go up to Syracuse, New York, to play 6th-seeded South Dakota State in the first round of the NCAA tournament. Game starts at 11 a.m. But let's get a commercial break, and when we come back, we'll have a new set of analysts to talk about the men's ice hockey team's quarterfinal loss in the ECAC hockey tournament. We'll be right back. Welcome to the WQAQ Morning Show. Dan Ball and Emma Spagnolo joining you here from the QAQ studios in Hamden. And Emma, it is that time of year again. Welcome back to Bobcat Breakdown, about to talk some Quinnipiac hockey, but we had to do a little switch up. Joining me now are MJ Baird and Kyle Lavasser. I think you guys know a thing or two about this men's ice hockey team? I do. I'm not sure about Kyle, Katie. Whoa, oh, you came to fight tonight. All hey, right. Hey, there's going to be a lot of things, a lot of cool things to talk about tonight. I'm All right. in a fighting mood. Let's right. see it. The men's ice hockey team, who was the number one seed in the ECAC hockey playoffs, took on number eight Brown in the quarterfinals this past weekend. Brown won game one in overtime and then scored four goals in the third period to win game two with a final score of four to three. And Captain Chase Prisky didn't see the ice. He was serving a two-game suspension. MJ, Prisky not being on the ice was huge. Should he take the most responsibility for this loss or is something or someone else more responsible? Um, I'm not sure you can put responsibility, Katie, on someone who didn't even play in the game. Should he have kicked a player and gotten suspended? No, but I don't think that has anything to do with the responsibility for this weekend. Um, for me, the thing that was most responsible, that, that I attribute it to at least, was just the lack of effort and buy-in from this team. We heard it, Kyle, from Rand Pecknold after the game, how he, he just, it was, he didn't say this, Kyle, but I got the feeling that this is shades of last year, right? This team didn't buy in to the Quinnipiac identity night in and night out. They did on some nights, but the very next night they could go out and not. So I got that kind of idea this weekend, at least from what Pecknell, you know, told the media. I think that that poor effort translated. You could see it very clearly. Once the team faced adversity, they just absolutely crumbled from there. So that is what I think was the biggest, biggest factor. I completely disagree with you, MJ. Kyle came to fight, I guess. Did they not handle adversity well? Yes. But the biggest reason that they were swept by Brown at home in the playoffs mm -hmm. was because they were the Quinnipiac Bobcats were missing 
the heart and soul of their team, Chase Prisky. Mm -hmm. I'm not just going to put the blame on him. You can put it on him. You can put, put it on the league if you felt that they extended it too long. It, it's up to... Do you feel they did? No, I thought it was a fair, okay. I thought it was a fair suspension. So, so we're, we, we aren't putting any blame on the league, the two of us? Right. Okay, perfect. I think it's the, the situation and everything. It, it was an immature moment, a snap decision gone wrong. Chase admits it, it was a mistake on his part. But the fact that he was not on the ice is exactly why they were swept. Mm -hmm. it, it was not the same team. You saw it, whether it was on the ice and they were lacking him on the power play. Uh, you saw it when, like you said, they were facing adversity and there was no one to rally the troops and make sure they would get back on the path that they've been playing all season long. When they had uh, the game tied in the first game and it was sent to overtime, if he's there on the ice and you need a goal scored or the whole period went, went by, if you need a goal scored in that overtime, you're giving the puck to him. Mm. In the game two, when uh, Brown ties the game at 2-2, He's going to make sure that even though they don't have a timeout in that situation, that he's going to stop the bleeding and make sure that Brown isn't scoring anymore. Uh, Quinnipiac was really lacking defensemen. The only really reliable defensemen they had were Carlos Schuksta, Brogan Rafferty, and Peter Deliberatore. If he's there, he's going to add depth, he's going to add leadership, and he's going to add both uh, an offensive and defensive weapon. Yeah, I think that it's fair to say that they lost because Prisky wasn't on the ice. But I don't think that's the most responsible, or, or the reason I attribute it to the most. So that's where we disagree. Right, because I think that what, even with Prisky on the ice, granted, this team would have not been in the same situations, but they just didn't look like the Quinnipiac team that we had seen all year, and I attribute that to that lack of effort and buy-in. Now, Prisky would have made sure the team had that buy-in, so I absolutely see what your, where your point is there, but I'm not ready to put the blame on one person. But wouldn't you, throughout the entire season, agree that he's been the heart and soul yes. of the Bobcats and they're not nearly the same exact team as when he is on the ice? Oh, absolutely. And we're going to get to that. Okay, so I guess we'll get to that. Katie? It's unfortunate right without him on the ice, but at the end of the day, what's done is done. Kyle, would you call this a learning moment or a disappointment? What do you think? As, I mean, it's definitely disappointing that they were swept and, and honestly lost three times to Brown at home. But to me, it's, it's more of a learning moment. I think they can move on from here and go into the NCAA tournament uh, with more steam than they would have, mm -hmm. potentially, even if they had beaten Brown. I think they're going to go in with a vengeance. I think Chase Prisky, having missed this series, really not having a formal last game at the People's United Center that he played for for four years, I think he's going to be angry. I think he's going to be disappointed in his teammates. And I think they're going to learn from that and, and see the – level that they should be playing at, and I think that's what they're going to do moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is certainly a learning moment from my perspective. It's not a potential moment to panic because this is still an NCAA tournament team, as you alluded to. We'll get to where they may see it in later, but this team's going to be in, you know, the big dance, if you will, for, for the hockey version. So I, I see it as a learning moment because it was a chance for the team to say, without Chase Prisky, who are we? And that is kind of what they're going to be next year, right? Minus a couple other guys as well. So definitely a learning moment, not only for this team to realize we need to turn things around for the NCAA tournament, but also for Impact. Look, all right, who am I without Chase Prisky? And I asked him after the game. I kind of tried to see if he would give me an answer. You know, did you see anyone step up in the leadership capabilities that Prisky brings? And he said no. So that's definitely something he's going to be on the lookout for over the course of the summer and the offseason. I guess it's like a little preview, you could say. So without Prisky, what is the number one thing this team misses when he's not on the ice? MJ? Katie, I couldn't pick just one, so please don't get mad at me. I have a 1A and a 1B. Is that fair enough? Uh, sure. Okay. I'll, I'll give it to you. 1A is leadership. I don't think we can speak to that enough. The 1B, though, is skill. I mean, you're losing a Hobie Baker candidate. You're losing a guy who leads your team in goals, who leads the country in goals by a defenseman, who's top five in points by a defenseman. Doesn't get more clear than that, does it? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I agree, but for me, 1A, 1B, 1C, all the way, the, all the way to 1Z really? is going to be leadership. Okay. I mean, it's exactly like you just said. Rand Pecknold, I was shocked that in the post-game press conference, he said no one even came close to Prisky's leadership. Wild. And I know how great of a leader Prisky right. is, but I see guys on the team like Odin Tufto, who I clearly expect to be next year's captain. I've seen guys like Alex Whalen, uh, who's stepped up into a leadership position. Even Andrew Shortridge, who has really carried this team so far and has been the best goalie in the country. I would have expected that Pecknold said at least one of those guys would have stepped as, up as a leader. So I'm shocked by the fact that he said no one came close to right. getting the guys ready or helping them face adversity. And, and I seem like a broken record just saying Prisky's a great leader constantly but that is just how important he is to this team. Right. When I asked that question, Kyle, I wasn't expecting anyone to fill. All right, so if, if, if this is Prisky's void, sure. I didn't anyone, expect anyone to fill this, but maybe like this, like half of it. Right. And he said no one even did that. That's, you don't win games like that. It's definitely not good when he's a senior also and you're going to be missing him next year. Right. Somebody's going to have to eventually step up and take that void. For sure. They'll definitely be a different team next year, but we do still have some games going forward. Kyle, does not winning the conference championship mean that they won't be a major contender for the national championship? Katie, they still definitely have a chance to reach the Frozen Four and potentially a national championship, as crazy as it sounds, after a, a dreadful weekend that they just had. It, it's absolutely possible. They could be a number two seed in a regional, which means they'll face a three seed, and then they would have to play their A game against the one seed in that regional. But we've seen them do that this year. I take it back to when they faced Massachusetts at home uh, in that big UMass game when they were the number one team in the country. Quinnipiac goes on to beat the Minutemen. Four to nothing, and it all comes down to goaltending, as we've seen when they've had great frozen four runs in the past. Whether it's Eric Hartzell as the best player in the country, Michael Gartig having an unbelievable playoffs, or now could be Andrew Shortridge, the best goalie in the country. If they get hot, they could take the Bobcats all the way to the national championship for a third time. Uh, plus, like I said, Prisky's going to be coming out with a vengeance. Uh, he'll, he'll be on a mission, especially after making it to, his, to the championship his freshman year. Now he's a senior. That could be just a storybook ending for him. And after coming off the suspension, he's not going to want to go out with one loss after what he just saw from the crowd. Uh, plus, I think the, the third thing that really is going to be in Quinnipiac's favor, teams that don't see Quinnipiac mm -hmm. that often tend to struggle against them, whether it's, uh, whether it's UMass like we saw earlier this year, um, or other teams that, that we've seen throughout uh, the NCAA tournament in past years, teams that don't see Quinnipiac tend to struggle against their style of play. Yeah, it is. It's tough to adjust to. These, these ECAC teams, they can game plan for it all year. Uh, Non-conference teams, not so much. Katie, to answer your original question, are they still national championship contenders? Well, to be completely honest with you, I've been on the record saying this this year, and I still believe it. I don't even really think this team ever was national championship contenders. Now look, you're going to attack me because they're, they were at one point the number four team in the country this year. But Kyle, I've been saying it, and I'm going to stick to it. This is a young team. I felt that their inexperience would catch up to them at some point, and they've proved me wrong all year long so far. However, you lose Prisky, and then this inexperience comes up, and they lose, they lose two sure. games that they were leading in the third period. Now, I get it. The NCAA tournament's different. It's a one and done, which could help the Bobcats or could hurt them, right? You saw they lost the first game against Brown. They were relying on it being a three-game series to try to come back. But the NCAA tournament's a different beast. As you said, we'll get to their seedings in a second. But all they need to do is win two games, and they're at the Frozen Four. If you're at the Frozen Four, you're a national championship contender, right? So I do not see it as that hard to accomplish, but I don't see them getting there. I've said it all year, so I'm going to stick to it. I think nine freshmen in the lineup on any given day isn't going to win you a national title. That's the crazy thing about this team, because I could see it that way, where they're such a young team and they get bounced in the first round, right. but I could also see them making it to yeah. the Frozen Four. Highly it depends volatile. which team shows up and just how good Andrew Shortridge yeah. is in net. That's a good point. Shortridge is going to be the key. All right, guys, thanks for your time. But one more commercial break before we hear from our basketball beat reporters on the men's floor. And I tell you what's on my mind. Keep streaming.
Welcome to the WQAQ Morning Show. Dan Ball and Emma Spagnolo joining you here from the QAQ studios in Hamden. And Emma, it is that time of year again. stretch of the show and I have a couple more things before you go. Last night the men's basketball team competed in the collegeinsider.com postseason tournament, the CIT. We have Brian Schwartz and Josh Silverman to recap all the feels from last night's game. And Young's final game, Aaron Robinson's final game with Quinnipiac, Abdullah Bundu's final game with Quinnipiac. They will move on, they will graduate, but for Quinnipiac they still have a young core in place with Rich Kelly, Jacob Rigoni, Tyrese Williams, Kevin Marfo leading the force, and it's a bright future for the Bobcats. The future is very bright for this team. I mean, there are even players you didn't mention, Ty Pick, Ron, and Jacob Rigoni, plays that can, that can score. Kevin Marfo is fantastic on the boards. They have great recruits coming in. This program will only get better. It's just a shame that Cam Young and the seniors that you mentioned that have played such a big part in building up this program, especially in the last two years under the Baker under the Baker Dun Dunleavy error, won't be able to reap those rewards, but they'll be able to watch them as far as the other players do. Tough finish for the Bobcats, but even when we talked to Baker Dunleavy after the game, he was proud of this team and the way that they progressed throughout the season. They end up finishing over 500 with a 16 and 15 total record. What grade do you give the Bobcats this year? I think it's a B. I think if they were to make them maybe the MAC Finals or something like that, if they would at least one, win one game in the MAC tournament, then I think they'd get a better grade. But ultimately, the record doesn't matter. If you lose in the first round of the MAC tournament, and then you lose in, in the first round of whatever postseason tournament you play. So I don't know how you can give them anything better than a B. And the only reason they get a B is because this program took another step forward. But you got to win games in the, in the postseason in order to get a high grade or, or really accomplish anything that meaningful. They did not win games in the postseason, but they did reach the postseason, and they are moving forward with a very high potential for this program. I agree with that, Brian. Should be fun to watch Quinnipiac over the next few years. For Josh Silverman on his final men's basketball rebound, Josh, it's fun, right? That's it, man. Four years. That's it. My senior day. Crazy stuff. We'll be back next year. Q30 Sports will be back next year, of course. He's Josh Silverman. I'm Brian Schwartz. Check out all our content at Q30TV.com at Q30 Sports. Good night from Newark. And that finishes tonight's coverage of winter sports. And now with just two teams active in their postseason, I want to end tonight with some final thoughts. We have two very different but very successful teams making the national stage. So how did they get there? A talented coaching staff certainly makes a great team. The values installed in our university that transfer onto our hardwooded rinks makes a great team. But the teams that shine the most have a natural team dynamic, special to them. The women's basketball team is bulk all up top. Three of their five seniors hit 1,000 career point milestones, three straight NCAA appearances, and the seniors haven't lost a conference game in two years. This class of leadership, this team, embodies what it means to juice up, as they say on Twitter. On the other hand, there's a men's ice hockey team that has a much different dynamic. The switching of players over the boards is much more often than a basketball sub, but one player stands out no matter who's on the ice. You know it, I know it. It's the Hobie Baker nominee, a defenseman with 17 goals this season and referred to as one of the top three players in the nation by his coach. It's Chase Prisky. As you can see, the difference in a group of leaders versus one single leader comes from a natural team dynamic. One way works for one team, while they didn't work for the other. Regardless, a team's dynamic and leadership comes naturally, and some teams run with it all the way. The championship bracket for the Division I men's ice hockey team will be announced on March 4th, that's a Sunday, at 7 p.m. on ESPNU. Remember, you can check out all of our content at Q30TV.com and follow our Twitter for the latest updates in QU Athletics at Q30 Sports. Thanks for tuning in to tonight's show. Good night from Studio 125. Thank you.